Now, any questions on homework? David. Okay, so I had a question on problem nine on homework 10.2, which was eliminate the parameter theta and obtain both and, and obtain the standard form of the rectangular equation. And it says circle um, h plus r cosine theta. H plus r. No, it was x equals h plus, plus r, sorry. Okay, that's all right. Hint, okay, I guess they're a circle. H plus R cosine theta? Yep. Yeah. And then Y is K plus R sine theta. Okay. So here's the deal. When you have these trig functions involved in these parametrically defined functions, the usual strategy is to isolate those trig functions and then take advantage of trig identities to eliminate the parameter, as opposed to Solving for the parameter theta, for example, what you could do, okay, you could subtract h and divide by, I'm going to do that anyway, so let's do it right now. Subtract h, divide by r. I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to subtract k and divide by r. Now, at this point, you really have two choices to make. One is to actually solve for theta. Theta is equal to the inverse cosine or arc cosine of x minus h over r. And then believe it or not, what you could do is substitute for theta in here the inverse cosine of that expression. You end up with the sine of the inverse cosine of that expression. It's a mess. It's complicated. But you know what? It can be simplified. Does anybody know the technique for simplifying an expression like the sine of the inverse cosine of x minus h over r. What's the technique for simplifying that, an expression like that? It's a count two thing. Trig substitution? Uh, no. It's what? It's using a right triangle. When you have those expressions like that, you set up a right triangle. I'm going to do it, okay? Okay, the better way, I'm going to do that too, but the better way is at this point, you square both sides. Let me, let me do it that way, and then I'm going to show you the other way, because you should be familiar with the right triangle method. It's messy at times, but sometimes it's necessary. Okay, square both sides, okay? This is common technique when you have these kinds of problems. Square both sides. Okay. And add them. You're taking advantage of the fact when you add these two, cosine squared plus sine squared, what is that equal to? One. And you've eliminated the parameter. And you have the standard form of a circle whose center is hk, whose radius is r. Actually, you could take the r squared on the other side, which is probably what WebAssign is looking for, this here, OK? And, and that would be the answer, eliminating the parameter, OK? I'm going to show you um, back here how to use that right triangle technique, because that, that we need that occasionally. If you actually solve for theta here, you're going to get theta equals the inverse cosine okay, of x minus h over r. Okay. Take the inverse cosine of both sides. Now, we have the sine of theta. Well, what's theta? We just said it. It's the inverse cosine of x minus h over r is equal to y minus k over r. Well, we've eliminated the parameter. But this is not a useful form at all. Okay, This is simply not useful. All right? We have to simplify. And the way to simplify that expression is to use a right triangle. Okay, That's how you simplify these kinds of trig uh, constructs here. Make a right triangle. This is, like I said, a Calc 2 thing. You should have had somewhere in Calc 2. All right, let's take a look at the inverse cosine of x minus h over r. What is that? That's an angle. The inverse cosine is an angle. 
It's the angle whose cosine is x minus h over r. That's what this is. Okay? Forget the sine for a minute. This inverse cosine is an angle. Okay? It's the angle whose cosine is x minus h over r. Well, I'm going to call this angle right here the inverse cosine of x minus h over r. I'm going to make theta equal to the inverse cosine of x minus h over r. Okay, that's what this angle is. I'm going to call that angle this. Now, what's the cosine of an angle? The cosine of an angle is the ratio of the adjacent side to the hypotenuse. What's the cosine of the inverse cosine of x minus h over r? x minus h over r, because that's what inverses do. They undo what the function does. If you take the composition of a function with its inverse, you get the argument. You get the original back again. That's what inverse functions do. So the cosine of this angle is x minus h over r. And the cosine we just said was the adjacent side. I'll make this the adjacent and this the hypotenuse. Okay. The cosine of this angle is x minus h over r. And the cosine is equal to the adjacent, which I'll make x minus h, over the hypotenuse, which I'll make r. Now check it out. What's the cosine of this angle? x minus h over r, adjacent over hypotenuse. Solve for the other leg. Use Pythagorean theorem. This other leg, therefore, is going to be the square root of r squared minus x minus h squared. Okay? Use Pythagorean theorem. With me? Is everybody okay? All right, Pythagorean theorem, okay? This squared plus this squared is this squared. Eh, it all works out. So, what do we need? The sine of that angle. What's the sine of this angle right here? It is equal to, the sine of this angle is equal to, Opposite, great. So what I'm going to do is the sine of this angle. It's equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse. So the sine of this angle is equal to this. You with me on this? I know this is true. This is why we don't do it this way, okay? All right, I'm t but I'm telling you this is the technique for taking care of things like this. Okay, what should we do next? What's that? Cancel out some R's? Then do what? Perfect. And guess what else? I'm going to bring this x minus h squared over here, but then I'm going to rewrite it this way. And guess what? That's exactly what we have over here. Okay? Now, there's no question this way is the better choice. And that's the way you do it. You do it this way. But I'm telling you, if you run across things like this, you handle them with right triangles. If you needed the tangent of the inverse cosine, this method would not work. There's no nice trig identity to handle that. If you needed the tangent of this thing, what you would do is set it up like we did, and the tangent would be this. Okay, square root thing over x minus h. That's what you would do. You could find the tangent, secant, cosecant, anything of that inverse cosine by using the right triangle. Okay. Okay, any other questions on homework? Okay, let's move on. We did the first derivative of a parametrically defined function, dy dx. We did the second derivative, which gave us concave up or concave down. There's one more thing we have to do with these, and that's to find their arc length. So let's take a look at arc length. Here we go. Let us suppose that we have some function. Okay. F of x. Defined parametrically. So we have an x of t okay, and a y of t. Okay, each of these defined in terms of t. Let's call this g of t and h of t or something. Okay? And what we want to do is find the arc length from a to b. Okay? This is another count two thing. 
okay? Back in count two, one thing you should have done is derive the formula for arc length. It's an application of the integral. Does anybody know the arc length formula from count two, the integral that you need to find the arc length of a function y in terms of x? What's that? It's like a square root of a derivative and like a sine function, I think. It's a derivative squared. It's something plus a derivative squared underneath. That's right. That's right. He's getting there. It's been like two weeks since Yeah, I know. <laughs> wow. Uh, what a stupid question on my part. I mean, geez, you know. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to derive it. But here's the formula we ended up with. The integral from a to b, square root of 1 plus the derivative squared dx. That's arc length when y is given in terms of x. And we derived that. We derived that. Well, you should have derived it in calc 2. What we're going to do now, we have x and y defined in terms of some parameter t. We're given it parametrically. We're going to derive the arc length for this parametrically defined function. And we're going to do it more or less the same way we did this one. So what we're going to do is break this up into pieces, and we're going to take one of those pieces. Okay? Call this little piece uh, delta x here. And the arc length right here, that arc length is approximately equal to the square root of delta x squared plus delta y squared. You're using the hypotenuse of this right triangle as an approximation for the arc length over that little interval. So here's what we have. That little piece of arc length is approximately equal to that square root. And that's how you start deriving the arc length in count two. Because what do you then do? Uh, you have an approximation by taking the sum of these arc lengths. Okay. And unfortunately, you took the limit as n goes to infinity here. That gives you equality when you take the limit as n goes to infinity. But the unfortunate thing is, It's not in the right form for a Riemann sum. So we couldn't jump to an integral immediately because in order to get a Riemann sum here, we need some function of x, f of x sub i, times a delta x. To get a Riemann sum, we need this kind of a limit. Am I still on the page over there? Yeah. We need this form. That's the kind of thing we needed. Once you get it like this, you integrate it. Okay, you you evaluate this limit, but with an integral. Why? Because this limit is the area under some curve, and the area under that curve is evaluated with an integral. Okay, so therefore this limit is done with an integral. Anytime you got that kind of a limit. You do it with an integral. All right? but we don't have that here. What we did back in count two at this point is we multiplied and divided by a delta x. Okay, That's not what we want here because x and y are given in terms of t. Here's what I'm going to do instead. I'm going to multiply and divide by a delta t. Now watch this. You've got to watch closely here because this is like magical. Okay. Now, when I multiply by delta t and divide by delta t, I'm going to divide by delta t in the form of, since I'm running out of space, the square root of delta t squared. And then I'm going to take that square root that I'm dividing by and put it inside this square root and end up with this. And you're going to have to convince yourself that what I have is equivalent to what I have above. Okay. 
check it out. What have I done here? I multiplied by delta t. There it is. I divided by delta t. I multiplied it by 1, in other words. But the dividing by delta t, I did it in the form of dividing by the square root of delta t squared, enabling me to put that inside the square root and then separating it into two parts. All right, check it out. Wait, right, Liam, what's wrong? Where's the delta t you multiplied by? Here it is. Oh, it went off the paper. Oh, my God. It's ding. <laughs> It's there. Well, that was a good call. Okay. All right, now, here we go. I'm going to take the limit as n goes to infinity. Now, as n goes to infinity, that means the number of these little intervals is going to increase without bound. That can count, too. That meant the delta x's would go to 0, and the delta y's as well. Okay. Here, it means the delta t's are going to go to 0. Okay. Because x and y are given in terms of t. As delta x goes to 0, the delta t will go to 0. So here's my question to you. As n goes to infinity, what happens to delta x over delta t as n goes to infinity? What is delta x over delta t as, delta, as n goes to infinity? What the heck is that ratio equal to? What is it? I want to know what this is equal to, delta x over delta t, as n goes to infinity. I want to know what that limit is equal to. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. you. Knocked me right off the chair. All right. It's the derivative. It's the definition of the derivative of delta x over delta t as delta t goes to 0. That's the definition of a derivative. If you had delta y over delta x as delta x goes to 0, definition of the derivative dy dx. Okay? That's the derivative. So our arc length is equal to, thank you, Dan, the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum square root. We'll have dx dt squared. We'll have a dy dt squared. Okay? Delta t. And guess what? We have a Riemann sum in t in terms of the parameter t. This is some function of t at times a delta t. That's exactly the form we need. This is a function of x times a delta x. This is a function of t times a delta t. So here's what you need to know. What you need to know is... This. But David, do you have that? Okay, no problem. Yes? Can we establish that delta t was approaching zero because you said it, or does that imply based on the limit as n goes to infinity? Both, Liam. Okay. Yeah, it's implied as delta x goes to zero, the delta t will have to go to zero as well. Yes, they are related. Of course, more important is the fact that I said it. No, no, that's the more important reason. That's a good call. That's a little, you know, something I kind of glide over. Uh, it's not really proven or anything. I leave it to people's uh, judgment that that would be the case. Yes. Okay, you ready? So here's what we have. Our arc length formula that you need to know is equal to the integral from a to b of the square root of dx dt squared dy dt squared tt. That's the arc length formula. Okay? Uh, let's do a problem. I'll tell you what. Let's derive the circumference of a circle. Something pretty straightforward and easy enough to do. Let's define it parametrically. Let's take a circle of radius r. Let's define it parametrically. Let's let x equal r uh, cosine theta. Let's let y equal r sine theta. What we have here is a circle of radius r. Okay. 
a circle radius r. Uh, let's find the arc length of this circle. Okay. So, arc length. Now we can take it. Let's see. At theta equals zero, x is equal to r. Y is equal. We're starting here. As you increase theta, x will decrease. Y will increase. So we're going around this direction. Okay. Let's take one quarter of the circle and multiply by four. Okay, we're going to derive the formula for the circumference of this circle of radius r. Uh, what should our answer be? Thank you, 2 pi r. Let's do it. We're going to multiply by 4. We're going to take the integral from 0 to pi over 2. We're going to go here to here, multiply by 4. Square root of dx d theta, in this case, theta is our parameter. Take the derivative with respect to theta. dx d theta would be a negative r sine theta. And we're going to square that. And then we're going to take dy d theta, which is a, an r cosine theta, and we're going to square that d theta. Ooh, this looks nasty. Maybe this was a mistake to do this one. No. You think, Anthony? Mistake? No. Oh, Anthony, you are good. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow, I'm thinking about, you know, figure out your averages in the end. There's Anthony was 87.1 A. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, <clears throat> excuse me. All right, so what, we, what happens here? Zero to pi over two. You end up with R squared sine squared. You got an R squared cosine squared. D theta. What can we do with that thing? Take an r squared out front. r squared comes out front as an r. I can bring it all the way out front. It's a constant. Inside the square root, I'm left with the sine squared plus cosine squared, which is equal to one. one. Forget about the square root. d theta. OK. Integrate it. Put in pi over 2, put in 0 to get 0, and we get 2 pi r, which is the circumference of a circle, of radius r. Okay? There you go. Any questions on that? So the numbers that go in front of the, if you have a problem like this, the, the coefficients in front of the cosine and the sine, would those be? The radius? Yes. Okay. Yes, it would. Okay. okay. Let me show you something else. I'm not sure you even have this on web assignment, but I should point this out. That if we were to, t if you go back to count two, after arc length, what you do is surface area. Okay? You take that piece of arc length, you whip it around an x-axis or a y-axis, you generate a solid of revolution. Now, you already know how to find volumes of these solids of revolution, depending on what shape they make. You can either use washers or shells or disks. But then you could also take an element of the arc length, whip it around an axis, generate a solid revolution, and find its surface area. Okay? Let's do that. What the heck? Got some time, we can do it. Here we go. I don't even think you have any homework on this, but let me just show you this. Let's take some function. And let's suppose it's given uh, in terms of uh, some parameter t, x of t, y of t, or theta, whatever. And we're going to go from a to b. Okay. And we're going to whip this thing around the x-axis. It'll generate a solid of revolution. Okay. We want to find its surface area. Well, here's what you did, and here's what we'll do. Integrals. What's that? Integrals. Yes. Yes, what we're going to need. Well, we're going to derive it right here. Watch this. 
If you divide this up into a delta x, what you should do is look at this little piece of arc length right here. Call it L sub i, the ith piece of arc length. We know that that piece okay, is the hypotenuse of that right triangle. Oh boy, I don't know how well you can see that. Well, you can kind of see it. Okay. Now, as this is whipped around the x-axis, what we want to do is find out what that is equal to Okay. What that area is, how much area is generated by taking this little piece of arc length around the x-axis like this, okay? That's what we want to do. How much area is generated by that piece of arc length, okay? And what we do is to cut it and open it up. And I'm going to, when I open it up, I'm going to get a rectangular like thing. Not exactly a rectangle, but pretty close to it. The area of that rectangle is its length times its width. The length of that rectangle is the circumference of that circle. The width of that rectangle is approximately the width of that arc. Okay? So here's what I got for a little piece of the area. A little piece of that surface area is approximately equal to 2 pi r okay, l. 2 pi r is the length of the rectangle. It's the circumference. The L is the width of the rectangle. It's the arc length. Now, if I'm going to go about the x-axis, here's what I have for my surface area. That piece of surface area is going to be approximately equal to 2 pi. Now, what is this r equal to if I go around the x-axis? What is this distance equal to? What is it? Wait, I think you said it. Who said it? Who said it? Who just said something? F of x. F of x. Good. It's the function. It's the y value of the function. Now, if I define this function, now back in count two, you used f of x there. Okay, that was used and that was it. Now, our function is defined in terms of x of t and y of t. Which one of those two is going to be the height above the x-axis? Y of t will be, okay? That's what the height above the x-axis is. It's the y value. So what I'm going to have, okay, is whatever y of t is equal to, in terms of the parameter, times that arc length. Okay? So. The surface area about the x-axis is equal to the limit, as n goes to infinity, of the sum of all these pieces Okay, and that is what, what do we have? We have a Riemann sum in terms of t because we know our length is equal to what we did before with a delta t on the end. So our surface area here, I'm going to put an x here, about the x-axis is going to be the integral from a to b, 2 pi r, which is our y value, okay, y of t, times an element of the arc length. It's complicated, but you can do it. Okay? That's what we have. And if we were going around the y-axis, the surface area about the y-axis is equal to 2 pi a to b x of t okay, times the arc length. Okay, that's what we have. Does that make sense? Some people are being non-committal here. Does that make sense? Oh, good. Thanks. All right. Um, I'll tell you what, let's do a problem. Let's take that same circle that we just did, and let's derive the formula for surface area of a sphere. This is the very problem that Archimedes was working on when he was killed by the Roman soldiers, even though 
The Roman general told them not to harm the old man. But they came through the streets in Syracuse and he was there working on this problem in the sand, the sand reckoner, as it's known as. And they told him to move along and he refused. Uh, in effect, flipped him off, whatever they used then for flipping me off. And then they, <laughs> they killed him. All right? They, they, they killed him. Um, but anyhow, let's do, anybody know the surface area of a sphere of radius R? You know that formula? What is it? Four-thirds pi R. Four-thirds pi R cubed is the volume of a sphere. Uh, what is it? Two-thirds pi R. It would be an R squared instead of an R cubed being a surface area, but it's not two thirds. It's four pi R squared. It's kind of interesting because it turns out to be the derivative of the volume, okay? Which makes sense if you think about how a volume increases by a surface area. They're all related, it all, it all works. It's really pretty cool. Let's derive that formula, you ready? We can do it. Okay, we can do this right now. Here we go. Let's let x equal r cosine theta again. Let's let y equal r sine theta. That is our circle of radius r. Let's whip this around the x-axis, generate a sphere of radius r, and let's derive the formula for surface area. What did Archimedes do at the time? Here's what Archimedes was doing at the time. He would take the sphere and divide it into strips, like starting at the equator and go up a little bit and find the area of that strip as a rectangle. Opened it up and, and used the rectangle. And then moved up a little bit more, found the next strip, and zzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
put in pi over 2, the cosine of pi over 2? Zero. 0. Minus, minus, plus cosine of 0, which is 1. one. Done. Okay? The surface area of a sphere radius r, 4 pi r squared. Okay, uh, that I think is probably more than what you need for 10.3. Yeah, 10.3. Uh, you need the first and second derivatives, which we've done. Minor, <laughs> um, yeah, do that for homework, and tomorrow, what do we do? Move on. We'll start polar coordinates. Now, did I tell you what the first step is? Next Tuesday. Did I see that? Yes. I think we're still on track for that. Because polar coordinates tomorrow, we'll start that. That's pretty simple. We need some basic polar equations. Not a big deal, blah, blah, blah. Tuesday, Wednesday, yeah, we'll be done Wednesday, basically. Uh, symmetry, you know, uh, so Thursday, I'll go over a uh, lab or something. Friday, we'll review. And Monday, um, we'll... Um, We'll uh, look at each other and then uh, Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> All right, see you tomorrow.